Again, happy Sabbath, happy, happy, happy Sabbath. My goodness me, we have the opportunity to be worshiping in two parts again today. How many of you uh, have taken the opportunity to go and check out what we are doing for Children's Church? I see that, yes, yes, we've had several individuals who, who have done that, and we really want, I really want to thank you for doing that because um, we have, a, I would say, another... Uh, third, as many people as we have here today who are worshiping with their children in Children's Church. And I, I want you to know that this is something, especially over the summertime, that uh, we can offer uh, to our, our, our families. I'm going to say Sabbath school will be going on during the summer. Today is the last Children's Church until August 31st, so don't invite your friends to a Children's Church that we don't have, Okay. <laughs> But um, uh, we, we, do, we do children's church because there are numbers of young families who really want their kids to come and to worship, but they are not going to raise them the same way as I was raised. So just understand, be, be patient and or um, helpful by telling your friends that we have a kid-friendly situation that is taking place twice a month, as you know, first Sabbath, like this Sabbath, and third Sabbath, usually, on the same Sabbath as potluck, that uh, is able to accommodate the very wonderful, rambunctious kids that we have and their parents, many of whom may not have grown up in this church and are wanting to have their kids learn about uh, Jesus themselves. So thank you for supporting that. Your offering somewhat today supported that, just so you know, and um, uh, I, I, do, I do want you to know that. Uh, thank you again for being here because we're starting a new thing this Sabbath. Throughout this month, we're looking at the idea of celebrating the goodness of God. Now, I, I don't know about you, but singing some of those good old old hymns, and I want to give a shout out to Richard. Uh, Richard's not here today, but he was our worship coordinator, and we work together to choose things that will go together, hopefully. So as you sang, this is my father's world, I hope that there was a feeling of joy in your hearts for the fact that your father has provided for you, and that here you are on a on a Sabbath, and you have responded to his invitation. And not just to his invitation, but his invitation to come and to encourage your brothers and sisters in the faith. Is that not what the Apostle Paul says? Don't forsake the gathering together of yourselves, King James Version. In other words, hey, don't not get together just because you don't feel that it's necessary for you, remember that it may be that you're going to be coming together so that you can be of service and be of help to someone else to encourage their faith. Uh, it may sound strange, but I believe that uh, even though we call this space in our church the sanctuary, okay, for various reasons, uh, both old and new, that piece of our building that is known as the narthex or the lobby, is actually where I believe so much very important ministry takes place. When somebody comes who hasn't been to our church before, I, and if you're that person today, I hope that you were greeted. I hope that you got a bulletin. I hope that you were invited to lunch today. I hope many things for you that happened in that space right there that are not happening here unless I were to do what I'm about to do, which is to say, turn to your neighbor, be it your, your family member or somebody you don't know, and say, uh, I'm happy to be, well, only if you are happy. I'm, I'm happy to be here today. How are you?
You see, we can use this space to do that very self-same thing, and it is important, it is so important that we, how shall I say it, that we notice, we notice people, we notice each other. So I'm going to notice God right now. Finish, finish this for me if you used it as a prayer in your life. God is great. God is good. No, 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 no. That's God is good. If I say God is good, you say all the time. And I say all the time. But what about this one? Did you pray this as a kid? God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. Okay, this was, this was the prayer you always wanted to have before a meal because it was short. Okay? But this is the prayer that I want you to go home with today. So I'm going to say it several times, and if I start saying it, I just want you to chime in with me. Okay? So let's do it again. God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. I, I, I've been intrigued, really, and this is, this is why we're, we're talking about this today. I, I've been intrigued by our modern use of the word good. Someone asks you, how are you doing? What's your response, Asher? I'm good. Somebody compliments you and encourages you and says, you're doing good. I'm good. Would you feel horrible if I told you that this was very sloppy English slang? Maybe even blasphemous. Would, would that hurt too much? I, I, I know that some of you enjoy being spanked in church, but I, I'm not that person, I'm not that pastor. But, but what if, let's just say if, what if when you answer somebody who says, hey, how are you doing? You say, I'm good. You're not thinking that, of course, the proper English response, I'm sure there's a proper Spanish response too, would be, I am well. I am doing well. And then, of course, if you're very polite, you say, thank you very much. And, and, and yes, thank you. And then if you're very, very polite, uh, as, as, as Mother Kit has reminded me, you would say, and you? Meaning, are you well? So uh, I, I don't know if this is poking at the bear to, to a certain extent to say, that this thing that we do so easily, this thing that we say just comes out of our mouth because it's so usual for us, might actually be uh, rooted in a cultural shift, in a, a, a mindset change that has taken place in our culture today that is actually embracing of a blasphemous attitude. What is blasphemy? Blasphemy is basically talking against God, talking about Him as not being God, not recognizing Him, not respecting Him. So you may think you didn't know about blasphemy before. Maybe there are small blasphemies and there are big blasphemies. I, I, I don't know, but I, I put forward to you a a thesis this morning, a, a proposal that potentially we have unknowingly, unwittingly joined in with an attitude in our world today that says, I'm good. I'm good. It's all, how about this one? It's all good. It's all good. Is it? Is it all good? That's a statement. That's a statement of being. That's a, that's a statement of your environment. That's, that's a statement of, of, of defense in some respects uh, concerning your actions. 
somebody questions your actions and, and you, you, you try to tamp them down and you say, hey, it's all good, man, it's all good. That's really like saying, you shouldn't be worried about this, even though you might have some questions about it because maybe you don't think it's all good. I'm going to tell you it's all good. Who said that you had the authority to say it's all good? See, these are things that, that maybe we should take into consideration sometimes with the way in which we participate in our culture. So again, I'm going to say, God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. Our text today is James 1, verses 16 and 17. And, and if you wanted to memorize one of the shortest texts in the Bible, I guess it would be James 1, uh, chapter 1, verse 16. Because it says, do not be deceived. And he says, brothers, I don't want you to be deceived. I'm going to say, people, I don't want you to be deceived. Verse 17, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. This is the New International Version. Uh, the Father of lights. How many of you have ever seen the northern lights? The dancing lights, the beautiful. I mean, if you've seen them, you never, ever forget them. But then on a, uh, maybe you've been camping and you've looked up, you've been someplace where there's very little unnatural light and at night you, you look up and the stars are just like right there. People who travel to Africa often say that the, the stars are closer to Africa. Well, I just think it's because there's, no, there's not nearly as much unnatural light. So when you get on a very cloudless night and, and it's cold even sometimes up north, you can, you can see the stars as if you could just reach out and touch them. He is the Father of lights. He is the Father in heaven, it says, and every good and perfect gift comes down from Him to us. Father of lights, and the rest of the verse is also very important to understand. Who does not change? And then there's a comparison made. Like shifting shadows. Nice alliteration. Shifting shadows. Maybe it is the shifting shadows who have come up with the phrase, I'm good. Apostle James says in verse 12, blessed is the person, the, the man, who perseveres under trial. I put in Psalm 143 today because it starts out as a prayer from David uh, because he's under trial. He's under temptation. And I don't know about you, but I was tempted this week. Anyone want to raise their hand and say, I was not tempted this week? I don't see any hands. That's amazing. We were all tempted this week. David is under pressure from, from people around him. He is being tempted to be a sort, the sort of person he knows is not going to be helpful to God. And so he cries out to God in Psalm 143, just like this person talked about by James in chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the person who perseveres under trial. For when he has stood the test, any students take tests this week? Yes, I knew Kehlani would be one of them. Several others are not here to say, but there were tests being taken and graduations being had and all that sort of last-minute stuff at the end of the school year. But this text says, Blessed is the person who perseveres under trial, for when they have stood the test, he, she, will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who, what? Love Him. God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. You know what? These are trying times. These, the, these, times, these times are not easy. I believe, too, that these are testing times. Some of us have hung out in the Adventist church all our lives. And we've been taught to 
to look for that time of testing, that, that time when it would be hard to be a Sabbath keeper. If you don't think that those times are now, I'm not sure you're awake. If you are a, a Sabbath person, if you are interested in the God of creation, it is not easy for you. And I'm not just talking about keeping Sabbath, because I'm not so sure that Sabbath was meant to be kept. I'm pretty sure that Sabbath was meant to be shared. Have you ever thought about that? Are you keeping Sabbath? I hope it doesn't rock your world too much, but I hope it rocks you enough to think, ha, this is a gift from God. He didn't mean for us to keep it. He meant for us to give it away. So thank you, Javen, wherever you went off to, to Children's Church. He was the only one who brought a friend. And that friend is now enjoying the tree outside. Yeah, that was Lizzie the lizard. She's gone back home. That's what mom told him. It was a good story. Helped him to be okay with giving the lizard back to its natural habitat rather than his hand. Tail, tail was still on that lizard. That was really good. But what if we thought about Sabbath as something that you give away because it's given to you by the God who created you and loves you and wants you to have this environment in your life and you would just love to share that environment with others in your world? Just a thought. Blessed are those who persevere under trial. For God has a crown waiting for you. A crown of life. Blessed is the person who perseveres under trial because they win. Ever thought about that? Because this crown that's being talked about here is the Stephanos. Okay, this is the, this is the crown of victory that you had in Greek and Roman times in the games. People used to not get a nice gold, silver, or bronze medallion. They used to get leaves. Laurel leaves. And they would be willing to run a marathon to win for a wreath of glory. Don't you want to win? I, I want to win. I did watch a, a certain basketball game this week. And it did go into overtime. And I could see on the faces of the players that each and every one of them wanted to win. Can you imagine the feeling of horror when in the last couple of seconds, one of the players on the team that was, was losing at that moment misunderstands what the team is going to do in order to win. And the seconds tick off the clock. And boom, they lose. Oh, pain, agony of defeat because you didn't know what you were supposed to be doing. Wow. Wow. God knows this, and he, he points to the fact that He gives us all the help we need every day. Jesus taught, pray this, give us our weekly bread. Okay? Okay? Could it be that maybe we have over-expected on God's part because He never promised that He was going to tell us what's going to happen next week? He is only going to reveal to us what we need to know, just as Jesus needed to know. Every morning when He got up, He prayed to His Heavenly Father. He connected with His Heavenly Father and He said, what's on the agenda today, Dad? And Dad said, I want you to go up this way to Galilee and on the way you're going to meet a lady at Jacob's well and she is going to tell the entire village what you tell her. Let me tell you, it's so much fun to be on God's agenda. It's so freeing. 
You don't have to take responsibility. You just ask Him to lead, and He does. James says, don't be deceived. If you want to be a winner, accept the gifts. Accept the good in you. Don't the, the, the fact that the good in you does not come from you, that it is a gift from the Father of lights. I don't know what else you may have been told by human philosophers. That good just comes out of you. But I'm going to tell you right now, my Bible says, my experience with the Father of Lights says that the good that is in me is from Him. The good that is in me, the good that is in you, is a gift from Him. Man says to Jesus one day, good teacher. Jesus stops him right there. And what does he say? Why do you call me good? There is only one who is good. So as we're thinking about this, this word good and maybe how we have used it or how we, how we think about it, I'm, I'm wanting to provoke good thoughts in your mind. See how proclaiming in response to how you're doing, if your answer is, I'm good, or I'm doing good, do you see how this could actually be presumptuous or even blasphemous? Do we presume to be good? Do we actually believe that 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 the good that we do is us? Really? Hmm. James 1.17 Every good and perfect gift is from above. So to casually claim that the good that we are doing comes from us, I believe amounts to theft and or larceny. Stealing. And what would you be stealing? You would be stealing God's identity. You would be claiming to be Him. If all the good and perfect things come from Him and you say, I'm good. Or you say, I'm doing good. Or you even think that what you are doing is good and that it comes from you. You're stealing. I'm stealing. Because there is only one who is good and from whom all good gifts come. Maybe we should give a more honest report when we are asked. I'm, I, I'm perceiving by, by God's good gifts, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm well, I'm well. Maybe we should say I'm persevering, excuse me. I'm persevering. Isn't that a, a lovely word? I'm I'm persevering. Are you really going to say that? No, you're just going to say, I'm good. I'm persevering by God's good gifts. Really, you're going to say that? I, I don't know. It's going to be hard to think of what to say. I'm well, thank you. Might be easier. By God's grace and mercy. This is a more honest report. Because He is good. And, and, and maybe you say, how you, if somebody asks you, how are you doing? You say, God is good, and, and I'm alive because of Him. Would that be too hard? It would be more honest. That's why I say God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our lives, for, for our daily bread, for our, our sustenance, which is our sustaining. God sustains us. If you ask the musician, what does sustained mean? For an organist, that means he's going to leave his finger on the key. This is going to be sustained. Okay? It's not just going to be punching at once. No, it's going to be on and on. God sustains us. He gives us our food. He gives us what we need. James says, 
Verse 1, 1 verse 16, don't be deceived. Deceived about what? Deceived about our own desire. You read the rest of that piece between 12 and 16, and you realize that our desires are to be great. Our desires are to be a winner. Our, desi our, our desires are, are to be thought of as, as the one who provides for ourselves. I, I'm, I'm, I don't know, maybe God is pounding this home with me. I, I, I guess that's why I keep sharing it with you, is that it's becoming very, very clear that the divide in humanity is between those who accept the good gifts of God and those who believe that they have to be the ones to provide for themselves. We could have the big debate about uh, law and grace. Sometimes we want to, you know, pretty it up, pretty this discussion up by big words like law and grace. But really what it comes down to is, do I accept the fact that good comes from the Father of lights and not from me? And that that salvation, this good thing that God has done, comes from Him and not from me. It, it, it pervades, it's sort of one of these basic things that makes a difference, I think, between people in this world. Kind of one of those major fault lines. James says, do not be deceived. How about, how about this? Uh, you know, I, I, think it's, I think it's one that dads maybe, but I'm also going to say moms. Do you ever get tempted to be the one that people depend on? I work hard every week. I need, I need my dinner on the table at 5.30 sharp. Because I'm the provider. You need people to need you. To depend on you. That's a big thing. People get divorced over this kind of stuff. But what if you realize that that kind of attitude was really saying, I don't want you to depend on God, I want you to depend on me. Because I depend on me, and so I want you to depend on me. Maybe this text in James is saying, no, the goodness that you need in your life is going to come from the Father. It's not going to come from you. There's one from, from way back who has said, see if you recognize this, I will raise my throne higher than God's throne. I will exalt myself. You recognize that? You see, because this one led a rebellion against the Father of lights and now has tempted and is tempting all humanity through smoke and mirrors. James says, shifting shadows to believe that good comes from within you. You self-generate good. And I believe that this is the basic blasphemy. The basic blasphemy that comes from the evil one. He has helped humanity, tempted humanity into joining his rebellion against the goodness that comes from God. So James says, that very short text, James 1 verse 16, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. One last point. So if God, what we've talked about here, if God is the genesis, if God is the originator of all good, then is it possible? Now here's where you're going to have to put on your, your thinking caps and maybe there's going to be some emotions involved. Okay. Is it possible for an evil person to do good? or to have good in them. Thank God you're saying yes. <laughs> I, was, I was hoping you would say yes. Uh, when I see good being done in the world, anywhere, by 
anyone, does that come from God? James would say, yes. God is good. It is He who is doing this in people. How, uh, let, me, let me say a couple of biblical names for you. See, see what comes up in your mind. Nebuchadnezzar. All this, he's speaking of Babylon. He's looking over Babylon. All this I have made. What happens to him in that next second? Lobotomy. Yeah. It's some sort of disconnect between his frontal lobe where humans separate themselves from animal kind. He loses his ability to reason, the Bible says. And he goes out and he eats grass. He is in the field for seven years. Very biblical number, don't you think? And then the connection between his frontal lobe and the rest of his brain is restored and God gives him back his kingdom. This is a good God. This is a God who gives David back his kingdom after he messes with Bathsheba and her, and her husband. This, this, this is a God who says, my servant Cyrus, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus, are these God's people? So in other words, does he use more than those individuals who call upon his name? Got to be. It's got to be. It, it, it's scriptural. The stories bear it out. God uses more than just his own people to do good in the world, both then and now. The horrible thing is, if you'd said no, I would have had to <clears throat> bring out the big guns and say, how many of you are free of evil? I'm going to say, I'm evil. I have succumbed to the temptations of the evil one. I have believed in myself more than God. I want to testify today to say, I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry, Heavenly Father for not trusting you, for not believing that the good in me comes from you and trusting myself to take care of myself. Because that is the temptation and that is from the evil one who said, I will lift up my throne above the Most High. I will exalt myself above the highest of heaven. So when, when I trust in myself as the genesis of good that I am supposed to do or be, then basically I'm joining with his way of thinking. And I don't want to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm believing that, that you do not want to be a rebel like that either. So God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for saving our lives. Let us thank him for gifting us with His goodness. Let us recognize His goodness in all people. Are we ready to go out? You, you ready to go out those doors and, and actually say, you know what? Pastor Mike is right. That person that I thought was just absolutely evil may actually have part in the plan that God has in the world today to do good. And that if I look hard enough, I might actually say, you know what, that person is actually doing good even if they don't know that they are. And that that good is actually helping someone. Yet, you know, I, I, I could say, other than that, they, they're probably serving themselves and they're pretty evil. How judgmental is that? From one evil person to another. See, God is great. God is good. Let us 
recognize His goodness in all people. When they do good, evil or not, they are displaying the gift from above. If we're going to believe this text in James, if we're going to believe that it comes from God, we're displaying a gift from from above when, when, when they do good, from the Father of lights. Dare, dare I remind you at this moment that this is exactly what the first angel's message talks about in Revelation 14, verse 7. The angel says, pay attention to God. So I'm going to say to you this morning, first angel's message from him to you via me is pay attention to God. Pay attention to the fact that God is doing good that comes from Him through millions of people in the world today. Do we hear about it on the news? No. So this week when I saw that there was a series called The Kindness Diaries on Netflix, I started watching it. This is a guy who literally takes a ride on a motorcycle with a sidecar and goes around the world. Penniless. He has to ask every night that he's on this trip, which takes him several months, he has to ask somebody else for a place to stay and food to eat. That's that's the deal. That's what he has to do. He sleeps in some amazing places, including in Philadelphia. He sleeps in a nook behind the mission with a homeless man who offered to share his space with him. Now what these guys didn't know was that the crew also had the power to gift. They gifted that man a house to stay in. They gifted that man education so that he became a cook. What do you think he did when he became a cook? He fed older homeless people as a cook. Goodness. Goodness from the Father above. This is a man who didn't say that he was a God-fearing man, but he goes around the world looking for people that have the goodness of God, have the kindness of God in them. And then he asked them for some of that kindness. And there were literally hundreds of people, good in them, God in them, who took him in. A stranger fed him, put him in a bed. In the case of the Indian fellow, put him in the only bed in their two-room little tiny place, the bed that normally he, his wife, and his two kids slept in, his pregnant wife. He put his strange friend in bed with his two boys, instead of sleeping there with his wife. His wife and he slept on the floor. Because you know what the Indian culture says? Do you know what Hindu culture says? A visitor is God. Now where have we heard that before? That you may possibly entertain angels. Unawares. But the the fact is, if you don't entertain, if you don't open yourself up to receiving the goodness of God through whatever He is going to deliver it with, then you won't receive it. So that's why I'm saying, are you you ready to go out these doors and say, you know what? I'm going to be starting to look for the goodness of God. I'm going to start celebrating the goodness of God as I see it anywhere in anyone. That's radical. I, I'm, I'm, I'm warning you. I'm just warning you. You may see the goodness of God this coming week in places you never thought that it possibly existed. But since we've established this morning that all goodness comes from the Father above, and that, number two, He can use individuals who don't even call upon His name or believe that He exists, He can use those individuals to do His good. Now, you're going to see the kingdom of God 
you're going to see his power and you're going to see it in a whole new way because you're going to see that there's so many more people than show up here on a Sabbath morning who receive the gift of goodness from God and dispense it to those around them. Goodness of God is amazing. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Amen.